aspect of writing. We somehow imagine that ideas float around and they come fully formed like those light bulbs over the head, like in a cartoon. And there you are, and, and you sit down and then off you go. But it doesn't happen that way. I used to have a glib answer to this question <clears throat> because it was what happened with my first book is that I, it all was the place for me. I would go to a place, I would become fascinated, obsessed with it, I wanted to know more about it. It would begin to people with characters and the story would evolve from there. That turns out to have been true of Los Alamos, but it's not true of this book. And somehow it's a little more prosaic. It's not inspiration and it's not the light bulb over the head. What happens is that one thing begins to suggest another. There will be some stray piece of information in a book that you don't have enough time to work on or develop, or something that intrigues you, a kind of side detour, and you come back to it. In that case, where one thing leads to another, there were two parents to this book. The first, and probably the most obvious one, was the book called The Good German, which I wrote, which was about the American occupation of Berlin in the summer of 1945. This was a Berlin that was physically and morally devastated by the war. After 12 years of Nazi dictatorship and six years of all-out war, two years of round-the-clock bombing, a horrific invasion by the Russians, Berlin had finally reached <coughs> Stunde Nur, zero hour. It was just flat. If you had a child who was ill that summer, it would most likely die. There were no medicines. There was no food. People were living off the crumbs of the occupying forces of whether British, American, or Soviet. It was it, the bottom. It would never get worse. The only industry that existed at all was the black market. And you had to do there and sell what you had to sell. Family heirlooms, sometimes yourself. Uh, GIs could pick up sex for one cigarette, famously. And over everything, the black market is the subject of the book and very much a metaphor for the kind of corruption that the war had led to in everybody, including the occupying forces. But over everything, like some huge chalk mark in one of those CSI <laughs> films, is this enor the sense of this enormous crime that has been committed. So large that in those days they had no word for it. The word Holocaust did not come into general usage until about 1954. In 1945, all that was known after you liberated the camps is that something so horrific and so ghastly had happened that nobody quite knew how to judge it or how to render any form of justice. If everybody was guilty, then nobody was guilty, but somebody must have been guilty, so who? And how far up the chain of command did you want to go? And who gets to decide? Is this simply a privilege of the victor, or is it a more nuanced kind of um, difficulty? Obviously, it's the latter, since if you go to The Hague now, they are still debating and arguing the finer points of what actually constitutes that kind of atrocity. It was therefore a city of great depression. I lived there in my head for about two years doing this book, and I never thought I would go back. But Berlin is very special, and it has a hold on you. It is also true that, you know, when you live in your head in a place for whatever amount of time, you don't just close the last page and then walk away from it. It becomes part of your personal geography. Because I had written about the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, any time now that I see anything new about Robert Oppenheimer, I read it. It's just of interest to me. I can't let go of that subject. I had set a book in Istanbul, and I now read the newspapers, the dispatches from Turkey, with a kind of personal interest that I didn't have before, because it's my Istanbul. You want to know about this. Berlin, as usual, is even more special, because what had begun to happen as you kept up with your subject, you know, your Berlin, is that after the wall fell in 89, there was a tsunami of archival material that was released, that had become available for the first time. Scholars would sort it out. A lot of it was translated. There were wonderful books based on it that were written. And as this flood came through, I was more and more interested and 
fascinated to see that the Berlin I knew, the one from the point of view of the American sector, that occupation, was only part of the story. That right down the road, another <coughs> story had been taking place under the Soviet occupation. And now, for the first time, we had access to, to materials that showed you what it was like. I was fascinated. I thought, you know, most of us think of East Germany, the GDR, as a political inevitability, one of those Soviet client states like Poland or Hungary. But it was not that at all. It was a made-up country. This was a political anomaly. It was a kind of ad hoc creation. Stalin didn't sit down in 1947 and said, gee, let's make an East Germany, and then we can you know, confront each other this way. That had never been anybody's idea. But as people went in this almost <coughs> kabuki-like um, dance of being against, you know, you say this, I say this, all of a sudden the ideological rift that had broken out very early was becoming wider and wider and more calcified. And you got two ideologies, two great forces in Berlin. And it was splitting the city, which was otherwise completely whole. This seemed to me a really fascinating subject. I wanted to know what it was like under the Soviets as opposed to us. And it was also a great excuse to go back to Berlin. I have to confess that one of the reasons that I set my books in these various places is that I like to do research. I don't mean to mislead you into thinking that I spend, all of, that I spend weeks in archives. Uh, I don't do that. Mostly what I do is walk the city, location scout, try to figure out, try to get a sense of it. I think it's impossible to know a place unless you know it on the ground. You want to know where your character lived. What kind of apartment building would he have had if he, had, if he was paying that kind of money? Uh, could he walk to work? Were there tram lines? What would he see? None of this necessarily appears on the page, but if you yourself don't have it, then the place can never be real to you and consequently can't be real to the reader. So I do a lot of just being in the city and seeing everything about it that I can and trying to absorb it. Now, admittedly, my tourist Berlin is not necessarily your tourist Berlin. There was one week when I was re researching this book when uh, my wife, who had to work, was back in New York. And so it was one of those weeks of emailing and Skyping. And I remember once she had emailed and said, how was your day? And I wrote back and said, oh, it's just great. I got up really early to go out to Oranienburg to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp, but I got back in time to visit the Stasi secret police headquarters and then the remand prison in Hohenschanhausen. And you can't imagine the interrogation rooms were so fascinating. And she writes back, so glad to see you're having a lovely time. <laughs> but Berlin has this stuff that is unique to it. It, is, it was at the fault line of the century and the fault line the politically of the century. So I knew I wanted to write about it. But how do you angle in? How, what, what approach do you take? What do you talk about that's new or hasn't been done by someone else? And what struck me forcibly in a lot of the material that I was reading, and I kept coming back to it, was that the Soviets, after this extraordinary <laughs> invasion, the atrocity, I mean, sometimes the statistic can tell you what things are like. In the first two months of Soviet occupation, and the Americans didn't arrive until July, so they had the city to themselves, April, May, June, there were over 100,000 reported rapes. And you think, just you know, think about that for a minute. These are the reported rapes. It means that the, un you know, the, the actual number is incalculable. Nobody can really compute that. And why would they even report it to the very authorities who were turning a blind eye to it in the first place? And obviously the answer was to qualify for the free abortions that were being given out to cope with this problem. And I thought, well, think about that and then extrapolate from there. What, what it was actually like to live, and what kind of attitude you would have to the incoming forces. You know, Goebbels once said, as a means to uh, encourage bravery and defense at home, the peace will be worse. And it may have been the one thing he ever said that wasn't a lie, because the peace was desperately worse for a lot of native Berliners. But despite this, the line that the Soviets and the German communists, their stand-ins, are beginning to pass out, 
and with great audacity, it seemed to me, is that they were taking the moral high ground, and the line was, we were the first, and we were the first anti-fascists. We were the first people that Hitler went after, which is true. If you were a communist in 1933, after he ascended, you left town or you were killed. We are the people, and we've survived. We're the remnant. We have prevailed. We are here so that we can finally have the second chance at creating the Germany that always should have been neutral, Pacific, socialist. It should, the one that should always have been before these gangsters hijacked the society and turned it into this shame and this disaster. We are the ones who are going to in, ensure that Germany can live again. And to this end, one of the things they were doing and promoting was German culture. And in a way, much they did a better job at it than the Western sectors were doing. Newspapers were licensed so that there were German newspapers very soon. Um, theaters were open. Books that had been banned under Hitler were rushed back into print. But far and away, the most visible mechanism they had to show that they were here to recreate German culture was to entice back from exile many of the prominent cultural refugees, the emigres, people who had fled the Nazis in the 30s, as early as 33, and who had been languishing for years in an exile that they suspected would never end. Now the Soviets were saying, come home, come home. You're going to be part of this. It was at this point that the other parent of this book comes into play, because I knew these exiles, or many of them anyway, because I had already written about them, but not written as much as I wanted to about them, in a book called Stardust, which was about Hollywood, post-war Hollywood, at its studio system, Apogee. This was the time, it would never be this wonderful again. In 46, 90 million Americans went to the movies every week out of a population of 150 million. Mm -hmm. They would never see such numbers again, ever. The studios were kingdoms unto themselves, and the mo Louis de <coughs> Mayer was the most highly paid business executive in America. It was an extraordinary time, and they had an extraordinary amount of cultural influence. And 10 years later, it was gone. Uh, the front story, the obvious story in the book, is about the forces that are bringing down the studio system, including their own political cowardness, cowardness when they face the McCarthy hearings, uh, which really ripped the guts out of a lot of creative Hollywood. The backstory, however, what had drawn me to it in the first place, were these German and generally Middle European cultural exiles who had ended up in, of all places, because I, it wasn't widely known when I was researching this, there's been more since and certainly wasn't known at the time. They had ended up in Los Angeles. And I was fascinated by this, but you know, I just thought that most people had gone to New York or London or something. But no, because the Los Angeles of the 30s is not the Los Angeles today. It was not then a world-class city, and it was considered even by Americans a kind of piece of exotica. You know, this was not a normal place for anybody who wanted to go. But the weather was wonderful. It was cheaper than an historical novel. <laughs> Things are different now. And it reminded them of the south of France. But really, they were going because of the opportunities they thought would be there for them in the movies. And we're not, and uh, this seemed to me a cultural collision of a sort that was inherently dramatic and so rich and interesting. And I don't mean it's poignant, it's sometimes comic. And I don't just mean the famous German actors who came only to discover that with their accents, the only roles they could play were Nazis, <laughs> and then they began to play their own oppressors. I didn't mean just those, but I was thinking about these guardians of high European culture who fetched up in Los Angeles almost by happenstance. You know, how did all this happen? We're talking about Schoenberg and Stravinsky and Thomas Mann and Bertolt Brecht, and Alma Mahler, who's Mahler's widow and Gropius' uh, mistress, and indeed everyone's <coughs> mistress. She's a very active Viennese lady. But as an example of how, you know, these are people who just escaped by, 
with the Nazis at their back, did they just escape the Gestapo, and now all of a sudden here they are under these orange trees and swimming pools, and, and the whole thing is just surreal to them. Alma Mahler, as an example of what they represented, got out by walking over the Pyrenees with a group. There was a well-known place you could bribe border guards and get into Spain and out of occupied France. And she did with a suitcase carrying the original manuscript to Bruckner's Fourth Symphony, which otherwise would have been lost. And now all of these people who see themselves as the last remnant of European high culture are in houses dotted along the Hollywood Hills and Pacific Palisades, and they're hoping to get a job in pictures. And of course, the movies aren't remotely interested. What they want is another Hope and Crosby road movie, they, uh, another Betty Grable musical, anything to please the troops. At one point, Schoenberg, in a famous, famously reported meeting, actually went to one of the studios and proposed that he write an atonal uh, film score. And you can imagine the reaction that they had to this. Um, you know, they wanted Irving Berlin, and he's doing something else. A lot of them had a really tough time. It wasn't, they were ran out of money. They were on charity. They were humiliated to ask their friends for money. They were working in a different <coughs> language. It was rough. They never knew who would, how long this would last. And now the war is over. And the Soviets, or their stand-ins, the German communists, come calling with an invitation. And it's come home. Come back to your own language where you can work. We're going to put your books back into print. We'll get you a lectureship at the university. We'll give you extra rations. You will have privileges. Yes, times are tough. You've seen the newsreels, too. But this is your chance to participate in the rebuilding of this culture and to make it the socialist dream that we once had. This is our second chance. You, know, you must come and come on this side. Now the reaction varied. If you were Thomas Mann or Leon Furkwanger, who were very successful, I mean it's a name you not familiar to you now, but in those days every book was a book of monk club selection and they were doing very well. They had nice houses in Pacific Palisades with water views. Why me? Why move? Most, however, were tempted like Brecht, who's going to, he's a lead motif in this talk because he appears frequently in the book, he's a character. And they are tempted but wary. Aside from anything else, there is no government in Germany at that point. They're <coughs> going back to live under one occupational authority or another. This is less than appealing and nobody quite knows what's going to develop there politically. So you, you, know, you want to be careful. You don't necessarily want to hop on the first boat. And there are difficulties in getting back, et cetera, et cetera. But most of these reservations just fly away when they feel the first winds of McCarthyism that's going to blow through Hollywood. McCarthy himself did not appear to 1950, so this is just one of those. McCarthyism is one of those generic terms we now apply to that entire period of right-wing hysteria when they went after left socialists. And many of these refugees from Hitler were indeed leftists or socialists and even in some cases communists. So they were vulnerable. They were people that HUA, the House on American Activities Committee, could really go after. Because they are political exiles, their antennae are much more sensitive than the native population. The natives are still living off the fat of the land. It's Hollywood. You know, we're still making Yankee Doodle Dandy. It's the emigres who see what's coming because it's eerily familiar to them. It was the very thing they had tried to escape in the first place, and now it's going to start here. Brecht has a very interesting way of dealing with this. He's called before the HUAC, and he proceeds to, if any of you are actually interested in this aspect of it, you should look up his testimony. It's just wonderful. <coughs> he gives testimony that is so opaque and misleading and misdirecting that the committee flummox thanks him for his cooperation and dismisses him because they don't want to admit that they haven't the faintest idea of what he has just said. <laughs> this kind of luck, however, can only happen once, and after his testimony, all his qualms were gone. He just went to the airport. <laughs>
And for many others, it was a dream come true. There were people who had been in Mexico City for 13 years, and they thought they'd never get out. And now, all of a sudden, there's this siren call, come home, come home. And so they did, a lot of them. And what they found was a wasteland. The Berlin of leaving Berlin is not so different from the Berlin of the good German. Even though you've seen the newsreels of all the rebel women who are cleaning up and cleaning up, four years isn't even making a dent in the destruction. People are still on starvation rations. It's still a place where there is no business. There's only sex for sale. There's the black market. It's a desperate, desperate time. They see this, and it is presented to them as, join it, you'll be part of this struggle. When Brecht arrives in October 48, his first morning, which any of you who have read the book will know, will perceive them in immediately that I've sort of cribbed a little because I gave it to another character, but he actually did this. Breck gets up at dawn or whatever, but very early, and he walks down Wilhelmstrasse to the chancellery, to Hitler's chancellery, which is now total ruins, bummed. <clears throat> and he sits on a mound of rubble and he smokes a cigar, and he just looks at it, and all the marble from Hitler's great hall has now been taken away to make a Soviet war memorial in Treptow, and all this left are these piles of bricks and it's he's dead and I have survived and I've survived and I've come back and as he looks around he thinks Hitler's gone but so is everything else and the Berlin of the three penny opera is gone and it's never going to come back this is going to be a very different experience for him nevertheless it was possible in those early heady idealistic years to believe that something could come of this, that there really could be a new socialist Germany, and an improved, and at least a, a country that would not be ashamed of what was going on. And indeed, a lot of the promises were kept. Uh, Anna Segers, who was a very, very famous writer in those days, maybe not as well known now, had been one of those people who languished in Mexico City. And she's now back and is a celebrity. They ask her to cut ribbons at factory openings, and she's on the front page of Neue Deutschland, and she's a figure. One of her friends, Walter Janka, is given the great studio to run. He becomes Louis B. Mayer for a few years. And then they give him the great um, state publishing house. He becomes a very big deal. They didn't lie. They promised him, that we'll make, we're going to do something for you, and they did. They gave Brecht his theater, his company, the Berliner Ensemble, which even to this day performs, although not in the same theater that he got originally. And it all seemed to come together and be the success that the Soviets had hoped. On January 11th, 1949, in a scene that I thought was so emblematic of this period and so terrific, that is probably what prompted me to write this book in the first place, it was the opening of Mother Courage and Her Children. Mm -hmm. And it's, it became a cultural watershed, one of those landmark moments. People years later would say, I remember, I saw Eleni Weigel, who was Breck's wife. I saw Weigel do Courage. You've never seen anything unless you've seen that, etc." But what struck me as so fascinating about this is that we are now in the time of the airlift. The Western sectors are, uh, are cut off by the Soviets, and they are surviving by this supply line in the air. 8,000 tons a day at its height of coal and food and everything. It's an extraordinary thing. But they're barely surviving. And you can hear the planes constantly droning. They're kind of, they land every 90 seconds, so this is in the air. And even so, everybody's fighting for tickets to this play. They want to be there on opening night, no matter what sector they're from. The French cultural attaché has to be there. The Americans are coming, the British, certainly the Soviets, and they are coming to the East. And as this opens, and as this extraordinary performance electrifies its audience, <clears throat> and one of its inherent messages, it being about, I mean, the war that is happening in the Thirty Years' War that's depicted on stage, is not visually dissimilar from the wasteland that's outside this theater. They can see it. And it's all of a sudden as if culture is happening again. Germany is alive, our Germany, not the Nazis' Germany. <clears throat>
It's really possible. Things are going to happen, and they're happening in the East. It was at this point, when I was in, in this scene and thinking about it, that probably there was the only light bulb moment um, in the composition of this book. Because I thought, what would have happened if Brecht, or somebody like Brecht, or someone who knew someone like Brecht, part of this group of returning exiles, lauded, enticed, beyond suspicion, even the mouthpieces of the new Soviet occupation authority. What if one of them actually were coming back as a spy for the Americans? No, they were the, la the last person anybody would suspect, and particularly someone who had been jettisoned from America. So what the protagonist becomes Alex Meyer, who is a German writer who flees Hitler in 33. Both parents perish in the Holocaust. He has a new life in California. The last thing he ever imagines is going back to Berlin. But he gets caught in the crosshairs of HUAC. He takes a principled stand. He refuses to testify. He's not going to name any names. And consequently, since he's not a citizen, they're going to deport him. And he is going to lose his child, his family. Under these circumstances, he cuts a deal with the fledgling CIA. And they say, go back, be our ears, and we'll clear it with the State Department. You do a good job, and we'll clear it with the State Department. We'll get your family back for you. This is a Faustian bargain that even as he makes it, he knows he shouldn't be doing, because he will very soon be in under, over his head. What, that's what he knows. What he doesn't know is that there are, are ulterior motive, the CIA's real plan, is to have him spy <clears throat> on the only woman he's ever loved, who has actually survived the war in Berlin, and is now the mistress to a very highly placed Soviet official. Mm -hmm. Leaving Berlin is not only about his plight, it's about the world that these cultural exiles found, and how they navigated through it. It's a world for them of great moral ambiguity, and they have increasingly ambivalent feelings about the level of collaboration that's required of them. Because despite all of this cultural patina and the opening of Mother Courage, etc., the Soviets are ruthless occupiers. They are greedy about reparations. They'll go and take an entire factory and just dismantle it and ship it to Russia. They are completely indifferent to the fate of the German POWs, many of whom, most of whom, are kept as slave labor for almost 10 years after the war. Most German POWs didn't go back till about 55. And they're equally indifferent to the press gang labor force that they set up for really dangerous positions among the German civilians. And worse than all of these is that at this time, 1948-49, we're segueing, this is exactly when this happened, they are <coughs> putting into place the infrastructure for the police state that the GDR would ultimately become, one that's beyond comparison with any other society. At the Stasi, at the secret police, at their height in the 70s and 80s, had 180,000 paid informers in a population of 20 to 30 million. I mean, the headcount ratio is extraordinary. No, it's never been a place like this. And the exiles begin to see this. They begin to feel what's going on. What are the reactions? For some of them, they cannot give up the only idea now that they've ever had, the only idea that they think is their hope for the future. And if we stay the course, it'll get better. It'll get better. And they deceive themselves into what's going on. Others who are more pragmatic, even cynical, again, Brecht comes into play, decide that they're going to accommodate and they're going to trade off privileges and the need that this administration has for these cultural icons, and they're going to, they're going to use whatever leverage they have. Brecht, to follow the journals and read a biography, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating, those years in East Germany. The, the officials, the Soviets and the German communists, become HUAC. He starts mister, misleading them and being opaque with them. They can't really mess with him too much, but they never, ever trust him. Nevertheless, he keeps his privileges, he keeps his theater. And then there are the others, like Walter Janka, whom I mentioned, who was running the big publishing house. 
who gets swept up in the new round of Stalinist purges. After Tito, Stalin went nuts and decided that what he would do is return to 1937 and purge the party all throughout the East. And among the people who were most easily purged were anyone who had been tainted by any, spending any time in the West. So we have with Herr Janka one of these great last surreal twists of fate where having escaped his enemy, their enemy, everybody's enemy, Hitler in 33, he is now the enemy for having escaped to the West and being contaminated by it. He is sentenced to five years solitary. Five years solitary is a really serious sentence. And he serves it. And when finally the thaw comes after Stalin's death and Khrushchev comes in, people are released and he's let go. And he stays in East Berlin. <coughs> the idea is still too important to him to move. This is at a time when all you had to do to cross over was simply walk across the street. Leaving Berlin is about people who cross that street or cross different kinds of lines. Alex, the protagonist, crosses a line when he makes his agreement with the CIA. He makes, he crosses a line when he lies to somebody he loves. He crosses a line when he pulls a trigger. I won't say in what circumstance. But there are some lines he doesn't cross and some lines he won't cross. <coughs> and what the book is trying to explore is what would you do to leave for them? What would you not do? Where do you draw the sector barriers, sector boundaries of your own personal morality? Where do you draw the line? Where do you stop? I found that Alex's position and the various decisions he had to make about crossing these lines, not dissimilar from the question that I posed in his in Istanbul passage, which is, what do you do when there's no right thing to do? Just two bad things. Are we often confronted with these situations where you do the least harmful, the lesser good? His decisions are what intrigue me, and they're what fuel this book. So naturally, I can only hope that they will intrigue you, and that you will find in his decision um, something that we can all relate to. Anyway, now that I've answered the most frequently asked question, I'm perfectly happy to ask less frequently asked questions, if any of you have them, which I hope you will, because otherwise it's dead air to <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I'm still in the process of reading the book, but one of the things I noticed um, that I guess <clears throat> hadn't really occurred to me is the similarity between what became the Stasi and UAF were doing. They were mimicking each other right. at, at that point in time. And it, it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Um, my question is, are there, are there actual incidences of people like the protagonist who did work deals with the CIA to exile themselves or to re-emigrate to Berlin in order to be spies for the US? Right. Um, if any of you haven't heard the question, is do in fact I know of any instances, like Alex, where he had made a deal to repatriate himself to Berlin to act as a spy? No, I don't. I mean, there may have been. I've never come across them. I can only hope this was an original notion. Um, one of the things that I that isn't as accurate as it might be in the book is that you know the CIA is presented as if they already know what they're doing. But in 1948, they'd only been around for a year, so we're talking about a level of professionalism they had yet to attain. On the other hand, if you're writing a book like this, you know, you don't want them to be amateur night, you want them to be um, a formidable force. I don't know that there was anybody who made this kind of particular deal, I, I doubt it. It's certainly not one that's come out. Well, some people were conscripted by the CIA yes. to do the work. Yeah. And blackmail to do it. I mean, this business about the mirror image, which is the classic Cold War view, is you become your enemy. And when you're fighting that kind of war of mirrors, you look at yourself in the reflection. You know, this is what's happening. But in this particular year, they were worse. You know, they were a lot more professional than we were. Yes? I'm curious why they chose LA. To, to immigrate to because of people like Von Stroheim? I mean, 
why, why, you know, these were high culture people, and everybody knew that what LA was about, and it was popular. Why didn't they choose New York or something like that? Well, a few reasons. Um, one, by the way, and I'm not referring just to the people who were movie people to begin with. I mean, obviously, somebody like Peter Lorre or Von Stroheim or Fritz Lang, they would gravitate there because that was their business. Um, the business, the factor, the weather was a real factor in all of this. It reminded a lot of them of the South of France. The word had gone out. Somebody like Lorre or Fritz Lang would say to one of his friends, "Oh, you should come here. You know, it's it's wonderful. The weather's terrific." And it was so much cheaper. I mean, a lot of these people were on a shoestring budget because you weren't allowed to take out anything if you were refugees. So they, you know, they, they were in tough times. Um, life was much, much easier there. You could get a house in a way. I mean, you wouldn't be doing that in New York. But even those who weren't in the movies hoped somehow that they could get some work in the movies and that one thing would lead to another. This was the great draw. Uh, it was particularly the case with people for whom language wouldn't matter, like musicians. Um, you know, let's pick up a job scoring something. The writers who were successful were the ones who were still writing in German, and then it would translate. I mean, Alma Mahler, whom I referred to, is now married at the time of that story, this story, to Franz Werfel, who wrote uh, Song of Bernadette, you know, which he did as a gift for their surviving and getting out of occupied France. So there they were sitting, and he's, I mean, he had a career and a reputation um, elsewhere, but in Hollywood he was the guy that wrote the Song of Bernadette. <laughs> it would be like that. And everyone hoped for that kind of work. I mean, Brecht worked with Fritz Lang on one picture, but mostly People had no idea who he was. You know, in, in Germany, he was one of the century's figures. He was one of the people that mattered more than anyone, and in Hollywood, not at all. But it was an appealing place because it was more easily managed, and there was this hope of work. Yeah. There was also the, the tradition of the white Russians who went to LA that ended up being you'd have a count who would be working as a busboy. The same thing, which is they were the, ob the opposite of political skills. You had the same thing to draw. This is where they right. could go. It was cheap, and their dreams didn't come true. I mean, originally, all the Russians go to Paris, right? And then Paris is taken over, so off you go again. It was Mike Romanoff, but just from New York, though? I can't remember. I mean, he, but he was not a count Romanoff, but he pretended to be. And, and of course, LA is a very forgiving place in that way. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> you, if you want to reinvent yourself, it's a great place to do it. It's built into the DNA. I say that in a positive way. I'm not <laughs> yes? Uh, being a Berliner myself, I appreciate a lot your presentation of the cultural and political situation. It was really just, just one little question. The, the cultural life was on both sides in the West and in East Berlin, but it's true that the Soviets had a kind of activity to catch all the writers, to feed the stuff by feeding them, uh, uh, which the Western allies did not have. They were writing a lot. But the theaters and music life started in West Berlin. Uh, and at that time, Berlin was not really divided. Right. Uh, the division right. came slowly. It, it started really with the Berlin blockade. And, and after this, it was the borders were controlled, but not you could pass easily. You could still go back and forth. No, he's quite right. He's making the point that culture was everywhere. I mean, one of the reasons that these emigres are attractive to the East, by the way, is that politically they lean that way. And, and one of the other things that was part of the Soviet brief was to accuse the Americans and then later West Germany of hiring and working with a lot of ex-Nazis. The fact that the Soviets had also done the yeah, same thing right. was irrelevant. But, <laughs> and, you know, Adenauer once famously said, well, who else is there? You know, who, who else am I supposed to hire? But we came under a great deal of fire. I mean, they used it as a, in a propagandistic way. But it is true that on both sides, there was licenses given for theaters and publishing, etc. It just started faster in the, in the 
Soviet side, and they were able to draw these people because these people were in fact socialists. I mean, they really didn't want to be with the Americans. Thomas Mann, for instance, when he was thinking about leaving America, thought of Switzerland. You know, he just wasn't going to go to either. He was already, you know, he was very well off. He didn't, he didn't need that experience. Anyway. Yeah. But Brecht had an Austrian passport. Yes. He, he did not trust his own comrades. He, Brecht uh, was always, this is why he's in the book, Brecht is the most fascinating of all these people. He went there, but he never became an East German citizen. He had a passport. He could always get out. On the other hand, we're talking about somebody who had been in exile and on the run since 1933. I mean, all these years, there's a moment in the book where somebody says something to him about, why are you doing this? And he says, I'm tired. This is my last country. I don't want to go to another country. This is where my language is. And when he walks down the street, everybody knows who he is. So. <laughs> so. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, when you travel to like Berlin, do you take pictures? You know, I don't. And it's partly because I'm so low tech. I mean, I know that now it's really easy. You just take your phone and you sort of click it around. I don't know. Part of it is that old hair shirt attitude of, you know, if you don't remember it, was it really worth me? You know, you should have this in your own head. And of course, there are lots of photographs you can look at that are better. But I, I don't. I mean, when I'm doing the research, I, mostly it's print. I just read everything I can, the most valuable things are things that are written at the time, like journals and diaries and letters, and journalism, because what <laughs> isn't said, the assumptions that people make are really fascinating. But maps are great, I, and in some of these, I mean, Istanbul and Berlin, both, they're totally different cities 40 years later. You know, there are bridges where none existed before. And although those are just technical details, you, you want to get them right, because anyone who knows, a reader from Berlin, for instance, if you really get something wrong on the page, it stops them and sort of ruins the story. So you'd like to have it run smoothly. I do anyway. <laughs> it's partly that. Yeah. When you, when you start your book, uh, do you have the story arc in mind completely developed? No. <clears throat> and I never worked from outline. I, maybe I should. <laughs> um, I make it up as I go along. I don't mean that to suggest that you don't have any notion of beyond the next two pages. You do, and particularly if in a story there's a murder, you at some point have to know who did it. There was, I mean, in the good German, I was a third of the way through the book before I had decided who had killed him. You know, it sort of wasn't important to me at the time of getting into the story. You know, there's no fun in it for me, if or no sense of adventure and discovery. If if I already know what's happening, then it's like filling in, you know, like a coloring book. So I wanted to evolve as I evolved. I don't subscribe to that notion that you know the characters dictate what's going to happen. And they're they have these lives of their own. They really don't. You know, they're, they are saying exactly what I want them to say, for better or for worse. I mean, maybe sometimes I should let them take over, but it's not one of those things where they appear, you know, in three dimension and say, no, take it this way. Uh, you're always doing that. Yeah. I wonder if you've had conversations with people who were in Hollywood at the time McCarthyism was on the rise? Some, a few. I mean, I'll tell you, the, the business of testament, personal testament, I mean, people often say, did you interview people? Mm -hmm. uh, it was an easy question to answer about the Istanbul book because I have no Turkish at all other than, you know, to get on the ferry, you know. And my German is, I can do a menu, but not much more. I, was, I once took a course because I felt I should know some basic German, but, it, you know, I don't pretend to be fluent. It's just not the case. So you're limited in who you would actually talk to. But what I discovered when I did the first book, Los Alamos, it turns out that, unbeknownst to me at the time while I was writing it, a friend of ours actually was a friend. Of, it would have been a conduit to one of the few surviving scientists. I mean, so many of them died early because of the radiation. But it, it was a surviving scientist from the project. and. He said, oh, but I could have arranged, you know, you should have talked to him, and I would have arranged this, and he really knew, you know, and he and Oppie were like this, and et cetera, et cetera. 
And I thought, in retrospect, I'm so glad I didn't, because if I had talked to him, he would have the authority of the survivor. He was there. But he would only have seen what he saw. You know, this is, and it was his version of the world. I mean, if you think about, I don't know, a Thanksgiving dinner of the 12 people at the table, but if you talk to them two weeks later, they're going to have a different version of what happened. And I think it's much more important to just read as widely as you can to, to get everybody's notion. And otherwise, you, you kind of get yeah. derailed. Or it becomes about them, and then they're saying things like, you know, ah, but my story, you should tell my story. <laughs> Yes, I know. <laughs> but that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> so what are you working on now? Okay, well, I'll tell you this. Um, I, my usual answer to that is that I'm always afraid of talking it out, and so I never say what it is because you anticipate. I mean, if I had said, well, I think I'm going to write a novel about the returning cultural exiles under the Berlin airlift, and people would say, oh. <laughs> sort of roll their eyes, you know, then you're discouraged at the outset. But I will tell you this, that, I'm, that next month I have a trip planned to Moscow. Oh. 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 Yeah. Any more movies coming from your lips? Oh, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> you would like that. Why not? Right. Yeah. Were you happy with the good German? Oh. Yeah. No, I, no. Uh, but, I would, when, are we being recorded? <laughs> oh, we are. No, I always <laughs> said I would never diss the movie in public. Uh, and all writers do this, you know, I mean, because somehow they've already done the movie in their head, and so the movie. Uh, it was a dream cast, I think Soderbergh is a great director. It just somehow didn't work, I think. Um, I myself hope it becomes a cult classic so that we can sell a few <laughs> tie-in editions. You know, that would be lovely. But it, it's in the nature of it. You know, it's very different. I, right. When I was a publisher, I saw so many people go through that process, and it was always a veil of tears. And it was, oh, look what they've done to my child, etc. And finally, I said to one of them, look, aside from that very pragmatic answer of, there's a solution to this. Don't take the check. Yeah. You know, just don't sell it. I said, there's something else you should remember. I said, you know, the book, for better or for worse, is still exactly the way you wrote it. And it's still sitting on the shelf. And it will always be that way. The movie is not yours. The movie is somebody else's vision of this material. And how they slice and dice and rework it is something you're not really going to be able to control. You know, they really prefer you to be dead, <laughs> so, that, so that you're not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, but if we're not recording, shall I tell you one anecdote? That, I mean, there's always a Hollywood story, right? And one of the one of the line producers, very nice guy, and it turned out that Soderbergh, one of the reasons he was interested in the material is that he wanted to make a '40s movie, and he wanted to do it the way it would have been done in the '40s on a sound stage, on the back lot, and even to the extent of using lenses that were available then on cameras, and et cetera, et cetera. So he was going to make a Warner Brothers movie circa 1946. Fine. And as a result, he was very, very interested in um, the accuracy of historical detail. And saying, you know, if it was like this, I really want to know that. So from time to time, I would get uh, an email or a call from the line producer saying, you know, how did this work and how did that work? Never from the screenwriter, who, if he had a question, would email the producer to in turn email me, because if he emailed me directly, then I would be a living person, you know. So <laughs> this way it was a lot easier. Anyway, when the script was done, <laughs> said, I mean, I should have known, the early warning sign here is that I got a call from Ben once, early on, before we went into production, and we had already had George Clooney and Kate Blanchett, and I, I was ascending into heaven with happiness. This was, oh my God, you know, it's everything I would ever have wanted. And Ben calls and says, hey, great news. And I said, what? And he said, we've signed Toby Maguire. I said, really? For what part? And he said, well, for, for Tully. And I said, Tully? And he said, yeah, I know, he's a corpse in the book, but we're building up the park. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, right. So the script is done, and it's sent to me. And 
I thought, just be a grown up and be a good boy about this. And uh, I mean, the fact that there was, there seemed to be not a single line from the book in it, I thought, well. <laughs> <laughs> and Lena had now become a Jewish prostitute who had survived the war in Berlin. And I thought, good luck with that one, you know, but okay. So, but you want it made, you know, you don't want trouble. And who knows, what do I know? Maybe they're right, you know, et cetera. And they're, they're the pros. So I said to Ben, look, I won't comment on the characters of the story arc or any, you know, go with God, the whole thing. But since Stephen cares about the historical stuff, would you like some notes? I can go through and say, you know, were there sector barriers or blah, blah, blah. And you should make a dramatic decision about this. Nobody else is going to remember anyway. And it, it's really a question of what works for the movie. But at least he should know when he's doing it, if there's some error. Eight pages of notes later. You know. So finally I get to the end and I said, look, can I make a real plea here, though? The rest, you could take or leave, you know, what, whatever works for the picture. But as for the ending, I, said, I know you don't want to do an airport scene because there will be resonance with Casablanca, which is in the end what they did do. Um, but please, when Lena leaves, would you put her on a train or on a truck? Because at the moment, you have her sailing from Berlin, and Berlin is <laughs> And it may not affect the American market, but I think you will have difficulties in Europe, because you know, everybody will know this. So he said, but I looked on the map, and there's a river, and I said, oh, is that you, swan <laughs> you have her sailing to Amsterdam. This is just not possible. <laughs> so he said, I'll get back to you. And the next day he called me. Said, you'll be pleased to know we've closed the port of Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> so these things happen, you know. It's not a criticism of them. I, w I wish it had been better because all the people involved were so talented. I did get to go to the set for a few days, and it's a wonder to watch the level of professionalism that goes on there. I mean, everyone is just at the top of their game, and they know what they're, you know, the makeup person and the props person. And they're just really, really good. It's just when you're doing a piece of work that's collaborative, it just somehow sometimes doesn't gel. You know, a loss. <laughs> uh, as, but, but they can have another chance at any of the other. <laughs> 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 okay. Anyone else? Right. Thank you. Thank you.